everybody. Um, my name is Jo, if you don't know me, and I help out with the youth and young adults at YVV. And on Sunday, I had the privilege of coming and sharing uh, a message that I'm going to be redoing right now for you guys. If you were present with us either in person or in our live stream, you will know that we had extraordinary tech difficulties, including um, <laughs> having no screens available. So you had me trying to work everything on a whiteboard and getting some of my pictures wrong. Um, part of those tech difficulties, it turns out, is the recording of the morning hasn't worked and we've had great difficulty trying to get the live stream into YouTube for you guys. So we've decided, we, it's me, has decided <laughs> that I am going to re-record the message. If you're up for the chaos that was Sunday morning and the joy that came with it, the interaction that we had on the day, then I would love for you jump onto Facebook. Um, we have our YVV community group. You can become a part of that group and uh, you just have to request it. We'll approve you. And that way you can see our live streams and all the fun that goes with it. If you're happy to just be here for the message, I'm going to bring it again. It may not be quite as enthusiastic, but I'm hoping that it covers all the important bits of info that we need for you guys to know. Now, Today, what we're looking at may be a little bit contentious and maybe something that makes people uncomfortable because sometimes new ideas can be like that. So I've got my email up on the screen now because if you are feeling comforted by or challenged by or completely in disagreement with what I say today, that's okay. I never wanna get up a front or on a camera and have people assume that what I say needs to be agreed with. We can wrestle with it, we can talk it through. So if after today or later on, you're finding that this is something you want to talk about further, this is my email. You are very welcome to reach out to me and we can discuss it further and work out time to have a cup of coffee and work through and hear each other's voices. And I think that would be really good, especially if this is a new thing. Okay, so let's get into this. Um, if you know me, then you know that I like to let people know when I start talking what it is we're going to be talking about today. And I'm going to give you my three main sections, okay? The first section I'd love to talk about today is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. So that will be the first third of today. The second thing I'd love to talk about is battlefields and blueprints, okay? May not make much sense yet, but I promise you it will by the end. And the last thing that we'll be discussing is where those two other topics leave us today again if it doesn't make sense that's totally fine it doesn't have to just yet but we're going to work through it and hopefully this will let you know where we're at in um in our conversation today as we're going through it now last week we heard rob speak about holy spirit fullness and the way that holy spirit comes and fills us and fashions the world around us and something that we um talk about when these things happen when there's an infilling of holy spirit or there's a fashioning by Holy Spirit and the world around us, um, Christian language that we might use is that is God's kingdom breaking in. And it's a fun saying, but it helps when we know what those things mean. Otherwise, it's just a saying, right? So what we're going to do is talk a little bit about that kingdom of God and what it's breaking into. Now, the kingdom of God is something that Jesus thought was super important. And as Christians, that is, we're Christ followers, we want to be about what Jesus is about. Now, if you look in Mark 1, 14 to 15, I'm pretty sure it is, you'll get some of the first red letters in the Bible and the first words that Jesus spoke. And it's not a word for word paraphrase or phrase of what he said. We can assume that it's probably a, a summary of what he said. And it was his first time preaching, starting his ministry, and he called people to repent because the kingdom of God was near. Okay, it's a big deal, something that he started his message and continued all throughout his ministry to call people into was focusing on the kingdom of God. But if he's calling us to recognize that the kingdom of God is near, it implies that it's not near to begin with, right? Why is that? So we're going to look at our departure from Eden. So we're going back right to the beginning in the Bible. So when God created the earth, he, he created it. He did all these great things. He had an order in which he did it. And the man was created, woman after, and God said it was good. Okay. And he created men and women in his image. 
he gave them, he delegated authority over the earth to man and woman so that they could be like God. They could rule like he rules over the earth in the same way that he rules over them. It was a reflection of who he is on earth. We were supposed to be like God. And it was the establishment of his kingdom over earth to begin with. Wonderful times. <laughs> but if you've read Genesis, and it's okay if you haven't, there's this beautiful start and the kingdom of God is there. And then there's an interruption. You see, we have Satan disguised as a serpent. He comes and he meets Adam and Eve and he tells them, lies essentially about who they are or who they're not he challenges them and says oh you want to be like god then you want to have this this knowledge you want to eat from the tree of knowledge which was a lie because they were already like god he'd made them just like him he put them in authority like he is but he did he being satan tricked adam and eve in this moment and through that tricking he established the kingdom of darkness on earth so by hijacking their authority by tricking them into submission to him he also got them to submit their authority on earth he stole it from adam and eve and it established that rule of darkness that's gone unchecked since then so when jesus is talking about the kingdom of god being near it's a challenge to this kingdom that was established and created the broken world that we live in now. So understanding what the message and the kingdom of God really means, that's what we have to consider first, okay? Now, the Jewish people, and it was the Jewish people that Jesus was primarily speaking to when he was speaking, because he was a Jewish man, he lived in a Jewish community, and he was speaking to Jewish people about a Jewish God. So when he would go and he would say to people, the kingdom of God is near, what they would hear is that God was going to come and fulfill a promise that he made a long, long time ago. Following the fall, he made a promise that he would come and he would redeem and bless the Jewish people and God would reestablish his reign over all the earth. He would come and rectify that which had been stolen from man at the beginning. Now, Jewish people, they knew the prophecies in the Old Testament. They knew that this was promised and was going to happen, and they were waiting. They were waiting and ready for a Messiah to come to reestablish God's rule over the earth. It was a very welcome message. But the message was through the lens of their understanding. Now, a couple of weeks ago, you'll remember that Dai spoke about worldview and how our experiences and our culture and our um, family influences, they all colour the way we see the world. The Jewish people were the same. They had their own worldview. And because of their worldview and their understanding, many Jewish people thought that the restoration of God's reign on earth and his kingdom would look like a restoration of a unified political and geographical kingdom. Now, we sometimes talk about golden days and we throw back and do nostalgia. The Jewish people would do the same thing. And their golden days were when King David ruled. They had a unified people. They were a prosperous nation. They were secure. It was a national ideal where they had freedom from oppression because at this point in time when Jesus was preaching, the Jewish people were under oppression from Roman rule. They saw God's favour on their people, something they were not seeing clearly at this time. And they were excited about the economic growth and restoration of a very physical kingdom. There was also a second thought and understanding that this kingdom of God that they anticipated was coming would end all the spiritual things that were part of the kingdom of darkness. So things like the demonic, sickness, death, these things would also be taken care of and defeated, which sounds awesome, right? We that can understand why they would want a geopolitical establishment of a kingdom given their circumstances and this second spiritual kingdom being taken care of would be great. But this is where it gets a little messy because the Jewish people at the time anticipated that a king would come and swoop in and the new kingdom and rule would be implemented immediately. It would take place and it would happen and they would all experience it. And that's not the case. Um, we understand that Jesus was that Messiah. 
And as he came in and he was a part of the world, he was bringing the kingdom of God in. But then he was crucified. He paid the debt for all of our sins and ascended to heaven after his resurrection. But the world that we currently experience is not the kingdom of God fully realized. I mean, how would we explain to ourselves or people in our community that Jesus represents all of these great things, um, but when he established the kingdom, they didn't come to fruition. It's, it's not an instantaneous thing that we're experiencing. And I think it's really good to talk about this because I'm sure that I've heard it a thousand times and you would have heard it whether you're a Christian or you're not. People questioning the reality of God and the reality of who God claims to be by asking, you know, if God was real and God was good, then why is there sickness in the world? Why are there horrible things taking place? Right now in our world, we have pandemic, we have national disasters, um, weather disasters, there's currently war taking place. The kingdom of God is not fully represented in our world in any shape or form right now. And how does that work? If Jesus is the king that came to reign and bring the kingdom of God, but we don't have it yet. And we could get into some really religious and destructive talk if we started to look for explanations outside of God's word. Um, it would be so easy to say, oh, well, maybe it's my fault because of how I've acted, or maybe it's so-and-so's fault for what they've done and blame the situation of the world on people now. Um, but I don't think it's healthy <laughs> to look outside of the Bible for our understanding of the kingdom and shaping what it is we know solely through our lens and our worldview. We need to come back to God and back to the Bible and consider what we do know about God and how that means the kingdom plays out in the world today. So I'm going to introduce what I hope is going to be a useful um, diagram. And this takes us to our second point, the battles and the blueprints. Um, I love this. It's from um, teachings by a guy named Putty Putman, who is awesome. We love his teachings. If you were involved in our School of Kingdom Ministry, this is something that will be familiar to you. Um, now, quick plug in the middle here, not sponsored, but <laughs> want you to know, um, Patty Putman has a couple of books out. I own all of them. So if you are interested, one that covers what we're about to talk about right now is this one. It's, uh, it's called Kingdom Impact. It's a great, great book. I love it. It's currently on loan to someone else, but if you'd like to borrow it after them, you can definitely let me know. He also has a book called Live Like Jesus. Great book on identity. Um, if you'd like to have a look at that. And I do have a book with um, some information on stuff we'll touch on shortly uh, called The Theology of the Kingdom. And it's by George E. Ladd. And now he writes hefty books. I got some really big theology books by him, but this one that I'm referring to is a nice little handy, handy little one that you can um, crush in a day or two. And it gives you some really good insight into stuff that we're going to talk about and was kind of the forerunner um, for this idea before Putty got to it. So what we're going to talk about are two characteristics of God. We're going to talk about his goodness and also his sovereignty, so his rule, which is what we've been talking about with the kingdom. And looking at those things, we're going to discuss where God is complex and where God is simple. So on this little diagram, you'll see we've got the simple goodness, the simple complex, oh, simple complexity, <laughs> the simple goodness, the simple rule, the complex goodness and the complex rule of God. And we're going to talk through those particular things. Now, you'll notice on my little graph right now, that's next to me, it should be right now, we have a cross right off the, the bat between our simple goodness and our simple rule. So when I say simple goodness, what it means is that God's goodness and the way we understand it is easy. It's easy to understand. Things that look good are good, you know? Plentiful harvest, that's a good thing, yeah? Um, wealth and spiritual wealth and physical healing and all those things, that's easy goodness. We can recognise that. And rule, if his rule is simple, what it means is that everything that God wants to happen 
happens. And we can stay right at the beginning that that is not the case because if God's goodness was totally simple and God's rule was totally simple, then all of those things that were good and that we understand as good would come to pass. We wouldn't see the complexity and the tension that we see in our world today. So right from the get-go, that is not an option. <laughs> so we need to consider that one of those things, either God's goodness or God's rule, is complex. Now, if we consider that God's rule is super simple, so everything he wills to happen, happens, but his goodness is a bit more difficult to understand, that gives us the idea of the blueprint. Okay. So this is the sort of thing um, that if a church or an individual understands a cosmic blueprint is the world we live in, they might say things like, oh, everything happens for a reason. The implication is everything that God wants to happen, happens no matter what. However, that means that everything, including like floods, little babies getting sick, all of those horrible things are also part of God's rule and his will, which means that his goodness can't be simply good. It has to be complex and that we just don't have the ability to understand it. Um, so sometimes God is going to implement these things that seem really horrible to us, but it's, it's good because he's going to make it work to his good. Um, but he's implementing those not so good things. That's part of his will. Okay. The next thing that is a possibility is that God's goodness is really simple. So all the things that look good are good and all the things that look like the kingdom of darkness and evil are, but his rule is complex. So that's to say that everything that God wants to happen is good but not everything that God wants to happen does, okay? It doesn't look like the kingdom in our world every time, but it always looks good if it's the kingdom of God. Now, this means that um, if we were trying to think of a saying to encompass this particular mindset and theology of the kingdom, we might say something like, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Um, his goodness is never in question. His, our understanding of his goodness is never in question. But the way that his goodness interacts with our world and happens is not something that we fully get and it's complicated, okay? There's a battle happening here. Now, the last thing that's come up on my little uh, grid is the last option of mystery. So cosmic mystery. And that means everything is complicated. The rule is complicated, the way things interact with the world, complicated. God's goodness is complicated, sometimes looks like goodness, sometimes looks like sickness, um, but we can't tell when it's which because his rule's complicated. It's a bit of a mixed bag. It's very chaotic. Um, now, the problem that we have with the mystery, the cosmic mystery understanding of the kingdom, is it makes God completely unknowable. And I am happy to cross out cosmic mystery from our list of options because that is in direct opposition to what the Bible tells us about God. You see, um, the Bible tells us, I think it's in Hebrews or Chronicles, I've forgotten the verse, but that Jesus was the invisible God made visible. He was the absolute incarnation of who God is, which means that our God is totally knowable. And this particular part of our little grid, the cosmic mystery, where we don't know what God's about, we don't know what he's doing, makes God unnotable. And so it's completely incompatible with Christianity, which leaves us two options. It either has to be the blueprint where everything that God wants to happen happens, but it's not always good, or the battlefield where everything that God wants is good, but it doesn't always happen. Now. There are, both, there are both thoughts represented in Christianity today. And I want you to know that if you subscribe to either option, I'm not trying to poo-poo anyone's, anyone's theological perspective. I'm not trying to say you're wrong or um, 
that we can't have a conversation about this. What I want to stress is that my understanding of who God is and how the kingdom works only aligns with one of these. Okay. And that is that God's goodness is simple. And the reason I say that is because I believe it is in line with the Bible. We can read in the Bible so many examples where God's goodness is compared to human understanding. There's a verse that tells us, um, you know, if your child wants a, a piece of bread, who would give him a stone? What, who would give their child a scorpion? If you know what's good for your kids, wouldn't God know what's good for you? And so it implies that our understanding of goodness and God's understanding of goodness are compatible. They make sense. It also tells us in the Bible that whenever Jesus met a situation and he was trying to bring the kingdom of God and he succeeded into that situation, he always went for healing. He always went for unity. He always went for the things that we identify as the kingdom of God. So no death, he would bring people back to life. No sickness, he would heal people. He would teach people about God and make him knowable. Those things are a part of the kingdom of God along with peace and joy and righteousness. He strived for those things, which tells me that his goodness is simple. His goodness is easy to understand and easy to see. The rule, however, was complicated. Even in Jesus' ministry here on earth, when he was present, we saw moments where healing didn't come instantly. There were occasions where he had to pray more than once for people to be healed. The way that the kingdom engages with the world is more of a battlefield than a blueprint. Because in our world now, that kingdom of darkness that we spoke about a little while ago, it's still present but it's not the only thing that's present now. A little while ago, I mentioned um, George Ladd and he had this, um, this great little diagram that we, we uh, are gonna use now, but that we reference quite a bit in vineyard churches. You've probably heard us say the, the phrase, the now and the not yet. And we use that term to describe the tension of the world as it has been for such a long time, where we've had all of those things that broke in at the fall of sickness and death and, and sadness and grief, all those things, um, and the kingdom of God coming in and sort of overlaying on each other. Now, the crucifixion of Jesus, um, or the presence of Jesus, it was before he was crucified, if we're honest, brought the inbreaking of the kingdom and the first challenge to that reign that had gone unchecked for such a long time. But it hasn't been fully realised yet. We live in that time, the now and the not yet, where things are still partly of the old way, partly the kingdom of darkness and its rule over the earth, but it's being constantly challenged and battled with by the kingdom of God. Now, one of the exciting things about this is if we know that things can be influenced, they're not set and will always happen the way the blueprint idea has suggested, it means that we get to be a part of what it is God's doing. And I know that I talk about participation and I talk about this a lot because it's something that's really important to me. Um, but the passiveness of a blueprint means that in addition to God's goodness not being understandable, we don't really have to do anything because whatever God wills, you know, that person becoming a Christian, God's will, it'll happen. That person being healed, ah, oh, well, if it's his will, it'll happen. If we understand the blueprint as incorrect and the battlefield as actually what's taking place, this tug of war over people and situations, it's a much more of an active response because we get to partner with Holy Spirit and we get to step in and invite the kingdom to challenge and battle and take that ground, whether that's a person's life or their circumstances, back and bring it into kingdom order to have it reflect the goodness of God, okay, which I think is really exciting. Now, 
that when we look at the um <laughs> i'm getting i'm getting excited um when we look at the battlefield as our option our anchor point of god's goodness and the complexity of the rule means that we get to engage with the battle and we get to celebrate when the the kingdom of god is punching through and taking over now something that i didn't mention on sunday but was brought to my attention after um, when we consider this battlefield, I would hate for anyone to look at it and think that it's a battle that's going to be difficult for, for everyone. While I don't believe everything that happens on earth is completely ordained by God, I don't believe in that blueprint um, theology of the kingdom. Something I do believe is that the battle is already won. Ultimately, we will end up in a time where the kingdom is the only rule. And so I don't want anyone to be discouraged and think that it's, it's a fair fight. It's not. It's not. The, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom that's coming up against the kingdom of God is no match for it. So we can walk with the confidence of a God that is victorious. We can walk with the confidence of a kingdom that will reign over all the earth as it was promised. It's just going to look like a battle until we reach the fulfillment of the kingdom being fully established. I hope that makes sense. So it's a lot of words. It's a lot of things to process. And what I would love to do is end this reflection, um, just reiterating that the point I made earlier about all things happening for a reason, I don't want you to walk away with that sound bite and think, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. I'd like to challenge that and say that I don't believe that that's the case. All things do not happen orchestrated by God for a reason that benefits us. However, in Romans, it does tell us that all things get worked together for the good of those that love God. So please know that when bad things do happen and we're in the moment of the battle, we're pulling on that tension um, and trying to find our place in it. If we are experiencing horrible things, things that are part of the kingdom of darkness, it is not the end of the story. God is still working for your good and he can redeem any circumstance. It doesn't mean that he orchestrated it. Okay. <laughs> I hope you're still with me. I know I got a little bit excited in the middle there and I hope I've been clear and I make sense. The way that I'd like to end today is with an opportunity for you to take some time to respond wherever you're at with this conversation. It's possible that this is the first time you've taken a moment to reflect on God's goodness being simple. Perhaps it's the first time in a while and you are maybe just taking a moment to, to recognize that God's goodness is simple, even if its expression in the world is complex because of the complex rule of God. If that's you today, I just want to encourage you to take time to let God minister to you directly. Let his goodness be something you experience today. He's an unknowable God. He wants to be known by you. He wants his goodness to be experienced by you. Take time today to bask in his goodness. You might be someone who's hearing this and realizing, yes, this is an opportunity for me. I am ready to engage. We would love to bless you with a power up <laughs> so that you can go and engage with that battle in a healthy way in God's power, not your own, and that he would show you how to engage in that battle. Or perhaps you're already engaging and you're needing a recharge for the next leg. We could be in any of those circumstances and it's possible that you're finding yourself in more than one. So what I'd love to do is just bless you today. Whichever one of those places that you are in, we ask Holy Spirit to come now and to meet you and minister to the need that you have. That he would fill you up with understanding of his goodness or the power that you need to engage in the battle, or perhaps the recharge for the next leg of your journey. Holy Spirit, come now. 
move powerfully in the person who is in listening and engaging with this conversation. We pray that you would bless them with what they need and get them ready for the next stage in the journey with you. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Alrighty, guys. Well, I hope that this has been a little bit clearer than Sunday if you're watching both. And if you're watching this for the first time, that it's something that has made sense. Um, <laughs> I always worry that I don't. And remember, you are more than welcome to reach out to me via that email address if you'd like to discuss this further. Okay, have a good day, guys, and we'll catch you next time. Bye.